Good afternoon. My name is Matt Felton. Um, I am a 23-year user of Esri, longtime fan, I'm currently president of Data Story Consulting. We are an Esri partner, uh, a very highly aligned Esri partner, and our, our job in that capacity is to help businesses implement Esri in the best possible way. And in doing that, um, we're always looking for best practices, we're sharing, we're coaching um, our clients, and I'm co-presenting with uh, my friend and colleague here, Patrick O'Brien, out of uh, New York City, um, who works with Winnick Realty Group. But first, I want to share a couple thoughts about um, how, how we coach, how we help, how we work with uh, companies like Winnick. A year ago, I heard this quote from Kevin Plank, the uh, man behind the, the growth and leadership of, of Under Armour. And he said, data is the new oil. And I got thinking about that metaphor and all of the implications um, around data being like oil. But I was particularly struck by how far we've come in the last couple of years. You know, it wasn't too long ago that we were all talking about big data and the deluge and kind of putting those umbrellas up because it, like, like an oil gusher up out of the ground, we had all this data and struggling with what do we do with it. But now smart companies are creating these platforms that are organizing the flow and the source and getting it to the right people at the right time. Um, Esri is such a beautiful example of that, of making the data available and integratable and all these wonderful things. And here's the thing about data, though. We can't understand it by itself. We can't understand it unless it tells a story. And that story exists in the data. Wh whether you can see it or not, it does exist in that flow of data and that pile of data. Um, and the story isn't good or bad. The story is what it is. What you do with it can be good or bad for your business. So if you can see it clearly and you can make a great decision from it, then you have an advantage. And we as GIS users, using a fantastic technology from Esri, have the ability, uh, one of the best abilities really, to see these patterns in data. You've seen these examples today. Um, it's like this lens, right, that just lights up those patterns. And remember, about 10 years ago, I attended a seminar by a fellow named Edward Tufte. And uh, he has been called the Leonardo da Vinci of data by the New York Times. And his seminar was all about taking complex collections of data and presenting them in these visually intuitive ways. And I remember sitting in the seminar 10 years ago and he said, and of all these ways, maps are a supreme way of understanding lots of data and engaging people. And I thought, this is cool. I'm in like the right industry. It was very affirming. Stories on top of those maps are particularly powerful. Um, one of my favorite podcasters these days is a guy named Mike McCarg. Uh, he's better known as Science Mike. And he has a very approachable way of telling complex scientific stories um, in meaningful and understandable ways. And he's a bit of a neuroscience geek, and he talks a lot about how stories affect the brain. And when someone is listening or experiencing a story, there's dopamine release, there's that reward, there's something called neural coupling, which helps the listener or the experiencer of the story to kind of associate and feel like they're in the story. And Unlike when you're processing just facts alone, which lights up two parts of your brain, stories light up like seven or eight parts of your brain. It's just, it's consuming. So coupling data with stories is very, very powerful. An example of that for us was a couple of years ago, um, Montgomery County, Maryland, which was one of our clients, just north of Washington, D.C., had this company, Fortune 500 company, you've probably heard of, Marriott International, that was considering relocating their headquarters. And in that consideration, they were looking at other counties. They were looking at other states even. And Montgomery County was really passionate about telling the story of their county. And they, they had been doing that through words and other presentations. And they came to us and said, can you help us tell this story in a different way? And we did. We put together a story map. We presented it to them. And Marriott made a multi-million dollar decision to stay 
based upon seeing the data that in a way they already knew, but they were engaged in the story and they owned it and they felt clear that it was the right thing to stay. Another great example, if we go to the Dallas, Texas area, um, we worked with a client that um, was advocating for um, some development of their um, schools. Um, a lot of new investment, $272 million to be exact. Um, and we put together a story map that this group used to advocate to the public and at a lot of community meetings and sent out, here's why this is important, here's where that investment's gonna go, here's the need for schools. And in an off election year, they had a 75% of the people in favor of that and a record turnout at the polls in favor of this. So those are just two examples of Marriott and this $272 million bond election that are helping people make decisions through data-driven stories. So I wanna to transition to my friend Patrick here um, and he's gonna take you to the the data mother load of New York, Midtown Manhattan and some of the challenges there. Uh, and before I hand it off, I just wanna tell the story about how we got engaged with Winnick. A couple of years ago, we were helping them with an implementation of ArcGIS platform and was in a room with about 15 high-powered New York brokers and we were showing them the great mapping capabilities, the great analytics capabilities, all this great data and demographics and psychographics. And one of the guys leaned forward and he said, so you're telling me I can understand where, like what the demographics and lifestyles are of the people living here? And I said, yeah, isn't that awesome? And he said, no, that's worthless to me. Nobody lives in Midtown Manhattan. And red faced suburb boy here was like, that's a really good point. So game on, let's close this gap. And um, that fellow was uh, Kenny Hockhauser, uh, Patrick's boss, great friend, um, great client. And um, so Patrick's gonna talk about how Winnick has, has grown and has filled that gap um, over the last couple of years. Thanks, Matt. And as he mentioned, that's my boss, so I have to deal with that question every day. Um, I, at Winnick, we are New York retail specialists. We do business across the country, uh, all sites of classes, but our central focus is figuring out, as Matt mentioned, that New York problem. Uh, as you guys know, um, New York is the biggest retail marketplace in the, in the world. It's also the biggest anomaly of demographic data. 1.5 million people live there, but the weekday population is over 5 million. We get 60 million annual tourists to the island. That's more than the annual tourists of Walt Disney World and Walt Disney Land combined. And our transit system, despite being so dysfunctional, still has 1.2 billion annual riders. That's more than any transit system in the US combined. So as, even in New York, which is immune to many economic recessions, we also have a retail compression. Uh, vacancies are going up, rents are going down, and there's a real need for data-driven site selection than ever before. As the Shopping Center Group's video mentioned, I really like it, retail is a matter of inches, and there's nowhere else in the world more apparent than that in New York. Um, in, in the past, county level, zip code, census block, geographies of uh, population and income were, they were serviceable. But nowadays we really need, especially in New York, to find people where they live, where they work, down even to the building footprint. So one of the data sources we use is New York's building database and we can create maps like you see it right, where we can, the, the red population is residential blues office and we can actually put through an estimate based on square footage of the building, how many people live there, how many people work there every day. And as retailers have to transform, so do brokers. We can't just be people out there kicking tires, showing you to the, the site we want you to pick. We have to actually, as Matt said, craft a story with logic and data behind it as to why you wanna be at this site why you'd be most successful here. And so at Winnick, we're really trying to pioneer that evolution into just into business advisory and consultancy services, filling that gap in analytics that maybe the small time realtors don't have an analytics team, will take your data and make it something worthwhile. So we do a lot of business in New York, but I wanted to include this as well. This is 
an example of a luxury home goods retailer that does a lot of online business, gave us their anonymized data down to the zip code level and told us, pick a spot in the country where we should locate. We regressed it against household variables, created an algorithm for a predictive uh, model where they would find the most success, where they should locate to find their core customer. We ended up putting them outside a suburb in Dallas. So I'm going to talk about the data stories of today versus the data stories of tomorrow. And today our thesis is really we want to identify and then capitalize on what we call market failures. We think those are the opportunities. We define market failures as where the retail tenancy in an area doesn't meet or doesn't sufficiently meet the retail demand. And to, to basically visualize that, we create windicators, patent pending, based <laughs> off data that we use, either open source, semi-open, we purchase it. New York, we're blessed with having a lot of open data, and we use a lot of transit data to find out not only where people live, where people work, but how they get to those locations because they're passing by those storefronts. One of those things we do is taxi data. We parse it by time of day. We can do whatever type of manipulation we want, but I just want to show these two maps. This is at left, it's taxi drop-off activity where people are, want to be at 11 a.m. to 2 p.m. versus evening 6 p.m. to 9 p.m. And you can see if a retailer is a lunchtime bodega versus a sit-down restaurant, how that would matter. Another transit system, a tra transit data set, as I mentioned, subway system. Uh, we can also take stations sized by annual ridership to give a popularity of a station. But it, for retailers, it doesn't matter always how many people are in the station, how accessible is your storefront to that entrance. So at left is the ridership map, but at right is actually the subway set station entrances, four to five to eight for each entrance, surrounded by five minute walk sheds. That's an algorithm we can use for accessibility of a retail site. Another transit data source we use is City Bike. It's really popular. It launched in 2014 with 40,000 trips on the system. 2016, we've had 14 million. We have 120,000 subscribers in the city, 600 stations, 12,000 bikes. Um, a new article in actually City Lab came out last week and said, if in distances under two miles, it's actually quicker to get on a bike than jump in a cab in New York. So we use that as another way to find where people are going. Um, as the Uber Media presentation pointed out, we're really trying to get down to the sharpest level of granularity as to where people are going. And at Winnick and in, Re in New York, foot traffic is paramount to everything. And until there's a data company that can you know, geocode feet, we uh, use analogs for that. And one of those analogs is Flickr. We grab Flickr and use that as an analog for tourism. It's a popular photo sharing platform across international and domestic uh, user bases. And then we plot that on the map based on co concentration of upload activity. And as you can see, not surprisingly, Times Square, Rock Center, Highline are very popular. But when you parse down to the lowest, lowest level, we can actually interpolate people's foot patterns, where they're turning, where they're lingering, where they're avoiding. In a similar vein, we use Instagram as a way to capture that coveted millennial demographic. Uh, for most retailers, millennials are the golden goose. They're young, uh, highly educated, often well compensated, tech savvy, highly mobile. And another thing we always try to capture in New York is formal versus informal economies. Um, one of the things that we do think we have a grasp on is tourism, uh, both hotels versus Airbnb. So the map at left, we have, we mined Expedia sized uh, Manhattan hotels by room count. Some of the biggest ones you see there are gonna be hotels with at least 2,000 rooms. And on right, I usually use these as an overlay, but I wanted to put these side by side so you could actually see for yourself. That's a concentration of Airbnb listings. And you can see that Airbnb basically stepped into the market where hotels weren't, took over that. 
Like I said, we tell the data story today, but sometimes we're tasked with telling the data story of tomorrow. As exclusive brokers for Chipotle Mexican Grill, we were approached earlier this year about coming up with a site that they thought would be a value add. It might not be the hottest neighborhood now, but they wanted it to be the hottest neighborhood in 10 to 15 years. I'm gonna walk you through a few slides that we presented them in an Esri data story, and they eventually did sign a lease at this location. One of the things we look at census variables is not only where college educated people are, but where they're going. We look back 10, 15 years and plot growth trends for that as well. We picked the neighborhood of Washington Heights South and Hamilton Heights, not because it's the hottest neighborhood right now, but it's actually had one of the highest growth rates amongst any neighborhood in Manhattan. Another analog we use for gentrification trends are liquor licenses. Bars and restaurants are often the first ones in, and we use their applications, not only their existings, but their trends as analogs for gentrification. Likewise, we use New York's Department of Building Codes. We scrape through permits for new buildings and building improvements. We think of that as smart capital coming into the market and thinking they can make a buck there. We can too. Street Easy Apartments Listing Database, we use that for one bedrooms as a heat map for where young people are going, where they're living, what they want to be. And so at left you'll see that's just a map of the heat of median rents for Street Easy right now, but at right is kind of the more compelling case. It's the rent trends over the last five years in Washington Heights South and the surrounding neighborhoods. Likewise, we use Street Easy for three plus bedrooms as analogs for families. Uh, single people might be moving into a touchy neighborhood, but families want safety and stability. In addition to figuring out what the demographic portrait of a neighborhood is, we want to see if there's an adequate supply and demand. So Chipotle wants to come into the neighborhood. Would they be a good fit? We use Yelp data not only to visualize it on a map, but to create a dashboard to say, especially for this neighborhood, if you look to the left, there's 100 restaurants, but there's 6,200 reviews, and the average review is 2.6. It sucks. Uh, and if you, you look at the cuisine, to the right, it's delis, pizzas, Chinese food. And you look at the price point, uh, all but two are in the lowest price points. So we told Chipotle they could come in there and dominate, and they eventually did sign a lease there. And moving forward, we're looking at other data sources and other partners like Uber Media to get back to my boss's favorite question as to how to solve the Manhattan problem. Matt's gonna talk a little bit about that. Yeah, just real quick, last slide here. As he mentioned, Kenny is always saying, what's the next big thing? I ran into him two months ago at a real estate conference in Vegas, and he's like, what's the next big thing? What are the new things? What are more innovative things we can do? Um, and I love that question. And, um, I'd been learning about Uber Media, um, and so as we're helping Winnick understand how to apply Uber Media, um, similar kind of patterns that you heard earlier, that question of who's living in this area and what is their lifestyle, um, we can do that now because we know where they likely live, we know where they're going, we know where they're passing through, um, and instead of a tapestry map that's color-coded and can characterize based upon where people live, we can light up the map, something like this, to show the people that are actually providing that demand in this crazy land of uh, midtown Manhattan. So we'll continue to innovate and continue to do that. And um, it's exciting to have been uh, working in one of the craziest uh, parts of the country <laughs> um, and pushing the limits of the Esri platform. Thank you. Thank you so much. I just want to highlight that was really remarkable. And, and when you step back and think about the power of data and analytics as a science-based function, we all know that that's the root of GIS technology. But what they also showed and clearly talked about was storytelling to bring it all together and allow decisions to be made. And I was struck by the creativity 
and the Windicators, all the different proxies that you were using to find information. I mean, so you can't just be a deep data scientist. You actually have to be a creative and curious person to think about what can we find in the data? What ways can we look at it to actually drive insights and decisions? So that was really fascinating.